Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you today. My name is Carmen White Yannick, and I am going to be the guest, along with my great friend, Matt Gleason of the Mental Health Association of Oklahoma. We will be talking about the effects of advocacy, how we can be greater advocates and advocacy with Black Americans, African Americans in the state of Oklahoma and across this country with mental health. So this is being brought to you today by the Mental Health Association of Oklahoma. All right, so welcome everyone to the Mental Health Download. My name is Matt Gleason, as Carmen wonderfully said. Uh, today, Carmen's gonna be talking about Black American advocacy, especially through the lens of mental health. Um, so Carmen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Matt. All right, and can you tell the audience a bit about yourself and then um, also about the kind of advocacy that you're involved in? Of course. Um, as I've stated, my name is Carmen White Yanak. Um, I've been in the state of Oklahoma for 25 years. However, I have very deep roots and very strong roots from both sides of my family within the state. Um, my mother was born here in a little small town called Wetumpka. But what I have been uh, immersing myself into around advocacy with black mental health, uh, because in my community, it is still taboo um, to talk about mental health. And so I, I started a campaign back in the summer of 2020, um, directly after, um, the hor horrific uh, murder of of Floyd, and we and what was what was really important to me is that we addressed not just what was happening with systemic racism, but how how this how the racism systemic racism was also inclusive of mental health, and how we were not receiving services, and how we were how we were dealing with the trauma of watching that not only his, because we, we speak so much about that, but Breonna Taylor's hearing about it over and over and over again. Um, Ahmaud Arbery hearing about it, seeing it. And so that kind of trauma when black folks already have uh, generational trauma 400 years plus of trauma. And it was important to me that we that I began to speak out and speak very loudly and very clearly and very particularly around advocating for our mental health. Yes. So, and you've touched on this, but what unique roadblocks do you see Black Americans, Black Oklahomans coming up against when they try to go to the state capitol and advocate or work in their community and advocate? What, what are those roadblocks that they're coming up against? Well, I, Matt, I would say the, the same roadblocks we've always come up against. Um, uh, I almost wore, I wore my Greenwood t-shirt today, but I almost wore um, my um, Representative Lewis, John Lewis's shirt, talking about getting into good trouble, making noise, getting into good trouble. And I, and that was something because all of these things, he, it was his death also. So there was a lot of trauma in 2020 that black people had to, had to incur. And so some of the roadblocks are the same as, as he dealt with in the sixties around and not being listened to if there's anyone that knows their community, it's those folks who live in it. And a lot of times legislators who don't look like myself uh, will not have an ear to hear what people are saying are happening in our community. Even when we talk about not only, let, but also policing, when we have when we have someone like Elijah McClain in our community. I have, I have a, a very good friend who's like a little sister. Her children are like my niece and nephew. And one of, their, one of her children is autistic. We fear for him if he was out because he's not as verbal. 
And so what happens when we, you know, how do we deal with people in the community who may have diagnoses or some who have not been diagnosed, but we also, we still know that they have mental challenges. And what happens in our communities a lot of times uh, when we are when we are present is that we will gather in front of the person and say, no, this, this, this guy, there's something else that you don't know. And so being trauma informed as in communities is hugely, hugely important. And that is some legislation that I would like to see go way, way deeper beyond the surface. And so much of so much of the legislation speaks to not systemic, but very surface level um, issues that you have to begin to peel back. And, you know, I, I sorry, not sorry, we have to talk about in this country, how far back the trauma, the PTSD, the that's locked inside of people who look like me inside of our DNA. And so how we are dealt with in, in our own communities or when we live outside of uh, traditional black communities, because a lot of us may not live in the communities in which we were brought up in and where we, and I'm gonna touch on this, where we see a lot where we're congregated often is on a Sunday morning in church. Well, we haven't had that because of COVID-19. So due to COVID, a lot of our connections we're missing a lot of those, a lot of those connections. And that's where we would begin to, you know, disseminate information. Have you seen this person? Have you heard about this person? So that as a community, we could collectively gather as a village around our most vulnerable. Uh-huh. And uh, one of the things I did not uh, talk about is that I now, I'm now the chaplain and spiritual advisor at the Family Safety Center here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, that's a whole nother beast of its own. And so, and it ties, it ties. And the reason why I took the position, I worked for myself for years. And the reason why I took the position is because it does tie into uh, my own personal mission. It ties into my calling as, as, as a minister as well for over 30 years. It, all of those things come together in one place Uh, particularly when I'm talking, because so to bring you all up to speed, the Family Safety Center is a facility here in Tulsa. It's about 15,000 square feet where there are several organizations all together. We have uh, Domestic Violence Intervention Services or DIVIS here in that we have legal aid. Um, The Family Safety Center helps people, helps our community to navigate when they need services like a protective order against an intimate partner or someone in the community. But what I will say, Matt, is uh, we get every everyone from uh, folks that that live in live in high rent districts, shall we say, to our to our um, most vulnerable who are living on the streets of our city uh, or who may be very transient or living inside of transitional homes and it becomes very difficult to get services and now we've added another layer and and giving everyone respect the respect that they're due when they come into our facility is hugely important for us. And so all of those intersections is where I have been since October of of last year. And so there were a lot of things that that were happening simultaneously. I said a lot, so I hopefully that that answers your question, uh, Matt, but I said a lot in all of that. That was great. Um, and as expected, you are helping transform our community. So thank you. Um, okay. So as you're, I'm so glad you wore that shirt today. Um, 
So coming up May 31st, 2021 will be the anniversary of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. Um, we talked a lot about it last year, um, especially related to our zero mental health symposium, had some amazing conversations. Um, but 2021 is going to be even more poignant because it is the hundredth anniversary of such an atrocity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how does that color this legislative session? You know, how does that um, really um, magnify the issues that you're going to be talking about and advocating for in 2021? I mean, a, a, again, this horrific um, atrocity that happened in the city of Tulsa. So for those of you who may not know, I'm not going to go all the way into it, but I, I think it's important that you use your Google machine and you Google and you find out all the information that you can, because that happened in America. That didn't happen in another in a foreign country that happened right here in mid America in 1921. And there's so many things that are that are continuously being uncovered. And and I will tell you that when we experienced the insurrection on January the 6th in this country, I'm going to tell you, I feared for my life. I literally was afraid to walk outside because I did not know how far that was going to go, how far was it going to reach? Because oftentimes, I, I, even in, even in our, our facility, um, there's something that happens when I see one of those red hats. Or a couple of weeks ago, someone had a Q, uh, a QAnon shirt on, and it was triggering for, for, for all the people of color in our, in our building. And it was hard. And we still have to uh, give support just like we would anyone else. So that's, that's difficult. That's difficult because you can't, you can't unleash it in that moment. So um, back to 1921, there was a, an incident between a black male and a young white woman in an elevator uh, that set off Greenwood, I have on my shirt, Greenwood was the epicenter of, of wealth for black Americans in the 20s. And in the in in the in the early 1900s, and so pe black people were flocking here from the north because it was a very um, it was a place where you could make money. It was a place where and 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 I was reading this most recently, Matt. We didn't have there wasn't um, the same level of open racism that we were that, that was being seen in other parts of the country until until this got set off and then when that occurred when that incident occurred then it was 36 blocks wiped out put on fire every business Every business, I almost wore my Dreamland, my Williams Dreamland Theater, uh, which was one of the businesses. And this, when I, when I say businesses, I'm saying every business on this, on this street was owned and in this, in this area was owned by people who look like me. It flourished, owned restaurants, lawyers, doctors, grocery stores, feed stores, theaters, all kinds of, and, and National folks came here to do to be to appear at a lot of the theaters and things like that. And so all of that was obliterated. And here in 2021, we're still working to rebuild that area 
And so it's not just the rebuilding of an area, it's a rebuilding of a people. And that is what is occurring across this country. And it is very difficult. And so we carry within us, and as we, as we came through 2020, we had a multiplicity of things occurring simultaneously, COVID that was taking out, literally killing very large uh, percentages of the black community across this country. We are some black folks, Latinos, and Native Americans, which are, which it, we're in Oklahoma, um, large collections and percentages of those particular groups have been hit very heavily. So we're talking about mental health. We're talking about, we're talking about the fact that uh, black folks do not have the same access to healthcare mental health care, and if you're mentally unwell, physically unwell, also we have higher numbers of pre-existing conditions, which is why many of us were dying at the rates that we were dying. And also, let's just be very, very clear that when we came to hospitals, I don't know how many of you saw the video of the black nurse who died in the hospital that she cared for many people with COVID because she could not as an RN, a professional, get the care that she needed to keep her alive and she worked there. Many people languished in hallways because they were not getting the, the help that they needed or they were told go home. You're not that sick, go home. So all of these things are, are inter, interconnected. They, they're, they're so intertwined, you can't just tease one out. And that's part of our issue is that we try to tease it out one by one when all of these things are interconnected. And so what occurred in 1921 when I came here 25 years ago when our family moved here, I knew nothing about it. Why? Because it wasn't taught. And now I've, I've, uh, now I've come to understand for the time that I've been here, it wasn't taught in the history books in this, in this uh, city or state either. We're just now. This is, this, like, this is like psh, mind blown. We're just now at 100 years just now getting a snippet, and it is a snippet, inside of our history books of what occurred because no one wants to really deal with the, the lack of humanity that occurred in those few days where people were, it wasn't just the burning down of, of, of buildings, Matt, and you know this, but it was also the displacement of thousands of people. And, and some of those same people who were extremely wealthy had to leave with the clothes on their back and they never recovered. Many people are buried in other states in paupers' graves, what does that mean? That means they have a grave with basically no marker and no one knows who that person was and their story. So now we have historians like Hannibal Johnson and different ones, they're here in, in, in Tulsa, who are recovering the, the stories of the Chandlers and the Sawyers and all the families recovering these stories so that we can understand the magnitude of what occurred in our city when a white mob crossed the railroad tracks and began to haul off men, began to haul off. If you can believe well, if you, if you know history in this country, you should be able to believe this, that we had in, internment camps 
Now we'd already had slavery, but now we have internment camps in mid in mid America after we've burned down communities and people's homes. And so that means that whole families were displaced. So um, I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I also want to give it its due because I know so many people are like myself when I first, when we first moved to Tulsa, Oklahoma with two children and I, I had no idea of what had occurred. And so I had to catch myself up um, very quickly. And I, and I was, I was appalled. Like, how could I not know this? And so here we are at the hundredth anniversary and it's bringing up a lot of feelings, a lot of, of unresolved because it's yet unresolved. And when things are unresolved, it continues to plague our minds, our emotions, which gets us back into um, a mental health or, a, or a, a, another layer of mental unwellness because we're thinking about when we go on Greenwood today, it doesn't look anything like what it did before. And the economy had, was cut off as a highway was placed right through. So all of those things, again, it's layer upon layer upon layer that has affected and infected our city. Well, thank you for sharing that with our audience. Um, it's always so powerful um, to hear things um, in your voice. You just have an amazing, amazing voice and perspective. Um, so I want you to speak to, you know, in, in this 2021, the 100th anniversary, um, when there are Black Oklahomans who are ready to become advocates for their communities, and especially related to mental health, and, and the overall well-being of their communities, um, I want you to give them some tips. Um, what would you What would you tell them to um, get involved? You know, to make their voices also heard at the Capitol. Yeah, and and one of the things that, that know your history and know how it intersects from with all of the movements, um, civil rights movement gay rights movement, how all of those things were happening and how it triggered other things. Know your history, read as much as you possibly can. If you have an opportunity to go back, I mean, we have so, we have so much uh, accessible to us now because of technology, go back and watch some of the YouTube videos of, of Hannibal Johnson. I mean, part of Watchmen was, was a piece of it was taken from, from Tulsa history. There's so much available to us. Go back and read, go back and watch, watch all of those things and then begin to figure out what is it for me personally that I can, I can place a stand on. You know, mine is, is a very wide scope of my black mental health matters. Um, but what does that mean? I'm, I want you to, I need people to get to a place of understanding that the, that African-American black folks, our mental health matters too, which means legislation needs to be targeted in, in areas like, you know, I'm advocating right now that I, I actually want a satellite place in North Tulsa for mental health. So that, because one of the things that occurs so often is that we always want people to come over here or come over there and then we'll say things like, well, if they really needed that help, it would go where it is. Well, now we gotta start talking about things like transportation, how do I get there? So there's a, there's a lot of things. And even with technology, it's also a privilege because everyone does not have access to smartphones. Everyone does not have access to a computer. Everyone doesn't have access to that. And so I, even when I was preparing for today, Matt, I was looking at some of the things like CDC and, and uh, all these things. And it's like a link. 
Well, what if I don't have a computer? How do I get to the link? You have information, but so one of the things that, that I, I feel is necessary of, of, of getting started, maybe you start, maybe you start with your church. Maybe you start talking with your pastor saying, listen, this, you know, because a lot of people I have listen over the course and around the, around the country, people that, that have talked to me, um, and especially those inside of the church who are having a really hard time. So maybe that's where you begin. You start with your church or you start with your sorority or your fraternity to begin talking about the reality of your own mental health and then move into local community, get involved with the Mental Health Association of Oklahoma, both here in Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Get involved. There are, there's a plethora. I don't even know if there's one area of a support group that we do not have something for. And the thing, the beautiful thing about this organization, if they don't have it, they will create it. And that happened this summer with right after George Floyd. And I led that, and I'm not saying it because I led it, I'm saying the importance of how quickly this organization moved because they knew they were getting calls, you know, daily on, I don't know how to handle this. I don't know what to do. And it wasn't just, so let me be very clear. It wasn't just outside, it was within. It was, it was mental health professionals who were saying, I need help as well. And so um, being able to connect yourself there and then be, we all have, a, well, we have an ability to send a letter. If, if, if you don't send a letter to your state and local officials, why aren't we doing these things? Why is it so hard for our, our, uh, our folks in our communities to get services? Why, why does it seem, why does it appear like um, people of color have to jump through so many ho hoops in order to get care? Why, are we, why do we have so many detours and blocks? And when I come here, then this person sends me three rows down. And then when I get to the third row down, then they send me five rows down and say, no, 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 after I get over there and there's all these blocks. And so what happens is that that fatigue, that emotional fatigue, and then also, Stop asking people of color to do all of your emotional labor. If I'm already at a deficit, don't ask me to do the heavy lifting of what you're supposed to be providing as, as an organization. And so, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I can, Matt, I want to, I want to speak to those who are already doing the work. One of the things that I did, I did this summer. I, I just absolutely refused to do things for free, and I'm gonna tell you why. In my lifetime, I just turned 56 in December. I have done more volunteerism that would circle my lifetime many, many times. So to ask a person of color to do something for free when they're already living as a person of color and already doing work and already walking around with the target on their back, to ask them to do something for free is just, it's, it's so disrespectful. Respect the level of profession, the level of skill, the knowledge, the wisdom, the lived experience that you can never change, that you can never erase. And when we speak to you, listen, do less talking, do less talking. Because there's some lived experience that we have that you, you, can, you cannot uh, extricate it from our lives. You cannot 
take it from us and say, well, I don't know if that happened that way. One of the things that happened in 2020 is when, when those of you who watched George Floyd's life be taken from him, you could no longer say it doesn't happen that way. So um, those are ways in which, you know, do your letter writing, call. If you don't want to write a letter, you don't want to type a letter, get on the phone. These still work. Get on the phone. If you have one of those people, if you are one of those few people that still has a landline, pick up your phone and call your state senators, your state legislators, national as well. And let them know this is something that's in our community that you need to shine a light on. Not, and not just the things that uh, give you good press and, and, and they're all shiny and glittery, but these are the things that affect very real people every single day and how they live their lives. Being able to get access to your medication, important. Being able to have access to therapy, highly important. And there are a lot of blocks to that. Carmen, thank you so much. Um, we're actually talking on a Saturday morning, so that even shows um, that you've gone above and beyond for us once again. Um, I want you to close this out, um, and these will be the final words of the podcast. I want you to give us, you've shared, as you always do, so much amazing wisdom with us, but share with the audience uh, just one last uh, bit of wisdom. So what would your parting words be? Every single person on this planet are people of value. We all come here. I believe this. I believe that we all come here bearing gifts, bearing levels of inherent value. It's hugely important that when we look into the eyes of every person, that we see them. And when we see them and we listen to their stories and their experiences, then we take that, internalize it, and then find ways and which we can make a difference that matters and a difference that counts and a difference that, that goes beyond our lifetime that then becomes our legacy. I want to be seen as someone that has made a difference in her lifetime and that has left a legacy of how to transform the wrongs of this world to make this a place that the grandchildren that I do not have, the great grandchildren that I do not have, but that I know are coming, that it is a place in which they can live and that they can not only live, but live peaceably, to live in a profitable way. And I don't mean that in, in monetary, but in a way in where your soul, the personhood of who you are can flourish and be successful in this world. And so I believe that if we all have a conviction, a conviction around that, that there's so many things that together we can actually eradicate and remove from our society and remove from the hearts and minds and souls of people who have been othered. And that we can do it in such a radical way with such radical love that it really can change the world. And that really is what I believe and it's what I live by on a daily basis. And today has been an amazing um, moment for me um, to share and right on the cusp of Black History, Black History Month that occurs in this, this uh, country every February. And um, I hope that you'll find a way to celebrate Blackness 
in this next coming month. Matt, it has been my joy to be with you today. Again, um, my most favorite organization in this state, the Mental Health Association, Oklahoma. Um, you are my loves and you're in my heart always. And I appreciate every time I have an opportunity um, to speak here and to be here with all of you. Thank you so much.